<clears throat> Namaste and greetings. I, Karnika Arun, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Neeti Anusandhan Samstan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we are gathered for a special lecture on paradoxes and challenges in approaching gender equality in India today by Professor Mary E. John. This deliberation is a part of the State of Gender Equality hashtag gender gap series, which is organized by the IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center. As the chair today, we have Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting professor at IMPRI, former professor of Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Welcome you, ma'am. With the permission of the chair, I would like to introduce the speaker and the discussants. Yeah. Kanika, please introduce the speaker and discussants. Yeah. Our esteemed speaker for today is Professor Mary E. John, the pro former professor, Center for Women's Development Studies, New Delhi. She was a director of the center from 2006 to 2012, and before that, the deputy director of the Women's Studies Program at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi, from 2001 to 2006. Major publications of hers include Discrepant Dislocations, Feminism, Theory and Postcolonial Histories, reprinted 2021, A Question of Silence, The Sexual Economies of Modern India, reprinted 2021, and Women's Studies in India, a Reader, 20, 2008. In 2021, the co-edited volume of Women in the Worlds of Labor, Interdisciplinary and Intersectional Perspectives, and the monograph, Child Marriage in an Inter International Frame, a feminist review from India were published. She was a co-chair of a task force set up by the University Grants Commission to look into the sexual harassment on Indian campuses and brought out the report, Saksham, Measures for Ensuring Safety of Women and Programs for Gender Sensitization on Campuses, 2013. Her areas of interest span the fields of women's studies and feminism within the social sciences with particular expertise in studies pertaining to marriage and family, education and labor, as well as more philosophical interests in the concepts or, and frameworks of feminist theoretical analysis. We are honored to have you, ma'am. Welcome. Moving to our esteemed discussants for today, we have with us Professor Pushpesh Kumar, Professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Hyderabad. We welcome you, sir. We're delighted to be joined by Professor Indra Ramarao, Scholar in Residence, Center for Women's Studies at Bangalore University, Bengaluru. She is also the former professor of sociology at the University of Mysore. We welcome you to the session, ma'am. Thank you. We are also joined by Dr. Lena Pujari, associate professor and head of department of sociology at Casey College, Mumbai. Warm welcome, ma'am. Thank you, Kanika. Now I invite the chair, Professor Vibhuti Patel, to initiate the deliberation with her opening remarks, invite our esteemed speaker, and to proceed further. Yeah. We look Thank forward, you, Karnika. We look forward to a learning from our esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Karnika Arun. And uh, first of all, I would like to offer my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Arjun Kumar, uh, Anshula, and Impriti for giving platform for such an important discussion on paradoxes and challenges in approaching gender equality in India today. We all, and I greet Professor Mary John, today's esteemed speaker, and the discussions, Professor Indira Ramarao, Professor Pushpesh Kumar, and Dr. Lina Pujari. Sociocultural political landscape for gender equality in India today is determined by complex mixture of new and the old. Uh, numerous modern institutions of governance, judiciary, politics rest on the base of the traditional gender norms biased against women, as well as sexual and gender minorities. Modernization, industrialization, globalization, urbanization have led to some irreversible changes for women, uh, some positive, but most of them are problematic. 
on the one hand opportunities for better education for mass of girls and women have expanded but that doesn't translate into jobs or careers over last quarter of a century decision making power of women in local self government has increased and all political parties are enthusiastically putting up candidates for the reserved seats for women in rural and urban panchayati raj institutions but the same politicians vehemently oppose women's reservation in the state legislative assembly state legislative council and the parliament women are entering the male dominated sectors aspiring promotions challenging opportunities they they they, they are grabbing but they have uh, they have been the target of strong backlash with increased violence within and outside the home and acute wage differential discrimination sexual harassment at workplace fundamental rights of the constitution of india guarantee equality liberty dignity but uh, religion based family laws pursue double standards in most intimate relations such as marriage divorce custody and guardianship rights right to residence and property reforms in legislation do not match the ground reality that is devoid of intersectional justice and level playing field for all genders gender binaries are challenged by lgbtq uh, lgbtqia plus community in an organized fashion but in a gender responsive budgetary discourses neither their voices are to be found nor the provisions made like in terms of funds functions functionaries to reduce gender gap in crucial areas of education health employment decision making combating gender based violence uh, current pandemic has also brought out such heartbreaking realities of migration reverse migration uh, adverse sex ratio which is now escalated as per the unfpa data uh, environmental degradation and the recent pandemic has also posed major challenges in terms of gender equality to understand the dynamics of paradoxes and challenges in approaching gender equality in india today today in impri has organized this special lecture and professor mary john is going to uh, give this lecture and i request professor mary john to start her presentation over to professor mary john uh thank you so much uh, professor vibhuti patel uh for that very warm and very extensive in such a short time you've actually covered more than i might be able to cover in the next uh, 20 minutes or so that is available to me uh i'd like to thank the organizers um impri uh for having me here and of course the panelists for uh, agreeing to be part of the discussion um may i have the first slide okay so um when i was asked uh, by the organizers to speak to and i think this is part of a a, a series of of discussions and we've already had i think one on mental health which is such a critical topic uh i thought i would go in for something a little broader more to set the tone for what i hope could then become more specific kinds of uh questions so hence this rather you know generic uh, uh kind of title that i have offered uh in order for us to think ahead uh because i think we have certain sometimes rather stereotypical notions of you know the big problems that will beset uh gender we are one of the most gender unequal societies in the world but if we have just a straight uh you know a stereotypical view of everything is very bad for women uh without some of the attention that i think we need to pay to some of the paradoxes some of the areas where the story isn't so bad necessarily some of the areas uh where we think we know but perhaps aren't as well informed as we think we are uh this is the kind of uh, set of uh thoughts that i want to uh, share with you today uh next so uh as i just said um my effort here is to open up issues for further discussion around gender this term that we all agree on or, or or believe must be the right way to go more equality less inequality um and which i believe are either not very well understood or even misunderstood uh and which is why i use the phrase of uh, paradoxes as well as challenges uh the notion of gender of course is very complex i will be beginning with the very basic problematic no doubt notion of binary gender that is those who identify as men or boys women or girls and are so counted to this very day in our statistical systems in this binary form 
and I will be uh, discussing today, I can't hope to cover many uh, uh, important areas. I thought I would try and bring together on to, you know, into our discussion, higher education, violence and work and try and see how they connect or disconnect in our own understanding. Next. So um, uh, can you see, is it clear? Because I have some you know, text at the top of my screen, so I hope it's clear to all of you. Yeah. Uh, I will begin with uh, higher education. And uh, interestingly enough, um, most of us who are uh, fortunate enough to be in higher education have not actually been looking at uh, higher education very much, except maybe very recently uh, in the wake of the kind of tensions and attacks that, that our institutions have been facing, especially the public in, in university has been under a lot of uh, scrutiny and, 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 and so on in recent years, but it has not actually been at the heart of our uh, concerns. And uh, this is something I noticed more than a decade ago, uh, that somehow the fact that we actually see lots of young women in our colleges and universities has something, it has happened and it is something we have actually not reflected on. So let me begin here uh, and set the sort of uh, tone by beginning with the picture at independence, the time when our first data sets uh, in higher education were put together. Uh, at that time, there were about one lakh students in all our public, at that time, it was pretty much only public universities of which 10%, that is about 10,000. Uh, were women students. Now this number expands, the overall numbers, we are actually at this point in time, we have about 38 uh, 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 million. Uh, so you can imagine the amazing expansion that has happened over the decades since that time, over the last 70 years. By 2001, the proportion of women students, and this is now just a very simple average category, you know, bear in mind the limitations of this category, are 40%. So it has moved from a mere 10 to 40% in 2001. And believe it or not, as per the All India Survey of Higher Education, which is our main source of information uh, based on self-reporting by all higher education institutions, uh, this figure has, has been creeping upwards steadily and has reached 49% as per their sources, 2019-20. And because we have an adverse sex ratio, the parity has actually been crossed. So in other words, the proportion of women in higher education is actually more than the proportion of men. And I wonder whether anybody here is in fact even aware of this. We've been nudging closer and closer to it and we've actually crossed it. This is of course, as I said, an average and it uh, therefore encompasses huge, huge diversities. You'll have engineering colleges, which were not so long ago, only five or 10%, some of them now up to 30%. And you have undergraduate colleges, some of which are 60% or more, B.Ed. colleges, 80 to 90% women. So huge variation, please don't mistake me here, but if we count them all together, we actually have a proportionate uh, number of more women than men. And this of course is in huge, as Vibhuti pointed out, huge contrast to the picture elsewhere. The question I want to ask you is why has this presence, this enormous presence of women in our uh, higher education institutions, not being more visible to us, right? You know, we, we talk, we, we, you know, visibility is one of those basic ideas we, we use in our, in our thinking, where we contrast visibility and invisibility to say what is visible and what is invisible does not translate into what is present and absent. So here we have enormous presence, but not visible to us and why not, okay? So I want to begin on this uh, seemingly very positive note. Uh, this of course needs absolutely in what we would call an intersectional analysis. How does this actually work out in terms of the various vectors that actually make us, make, make, make us who we are? Caste, community, urban and rural location. Uh, some of these I can, we can make visible with the help of data, national data sets, some we cannot disability barely being counted, but completely underrepresented, and some like sexuality not being counted at all. Next slide. Okay, so I'm going to use, this is 10 years old data that I had disaggregated from the National Sample Survey. 
to give you an idea of how the differences of caste make their intersection with gender. So if we look at the caste gender interface, you see these figures, they're sort of self-explanatory. Um, there are, if you go by these official categories, that is scheduled caste, other backward classes, and upper castes, you can see a progressive improvement. This is uh, among men. You can see it moves from 16.5% among scheduled castes to 30. I'm talking, these are, by the way, gross enrollment ratios in the 18 to 23 age group, right? Uh, it jumps to 31.7 amongst upper caste. So a much, much better proportion of uh, upper caste men are to be found in our higher education than scheduled castes or OBCs. And in the case of women, please look at the comparative figures. You can see there is a gap, what we call the gender gap for scheduled caste and OBCs. And notice, however, in the case of upper castes, gap is practically non-existent. This is 2010-11. The figures have actually moved upwards. I don't have unit data for you. They have gone up since then. But notice this, this amongst upper castes, therefore, there is this uh, uh, you know, parity, you might say, in a situation of upper caste privilege compared to situations of disadvantage based on caste. Next slide. Now, based on religion. Um, that we have data that you know gives us the capacity to look at uh, Hindu. Of course, is a very large category. About eighty-five percent of our population includes the many different castes that I, I referred to earlier: Muslim, Christian, and Sikh. Uh, I've just given you these figures. Here you can see uh, a differential between in the, in Hindu twenty-seven and uh, four point five, twenty-four point seven. A much much lower figure when it comes to Muslims who have been largely now more and more excluded, uh, find themselves in a position of exclusion from accessing higher education. Here too, there is a differential. Uh, the very interesting figures, Christian and Sikh, are actually, uh, uh, these are of course small population groups, 2.2 and 1.8% of our population respectively. But please notice uh, amongst Christians, there are proportionately more women and amongst six, the proportion is huge. The difference, that is to say, a very much uh, higher proportion of Sikh women access higher education compared to their brothers and cousins and so on. Uh, this is a, a, a very fascinating question uh, in and of itself. I won't uh, pause on it more. We can discuss it if you like in the sessions to give you an idea of this remarkable, either a converging is happening or even an overtaking is happening in the realm of education. Next slide. Okay, so now I quickly move to the most recent figures in, these are the IC figures of 2019-20, when the average of the gross enrollment ratio has actually jumped to 27%. And if I give you these breakups, these are a little different from the previous figures. These tell you that for every 100 students, what is the proportion today, or I, strictly speaking 2019-20, what is the proportion of these 100? How does it you know, break down in terms of caste? And 13.2, a 4.5 scheduled tribe, OBCs 30, uh, Muslims almost four, other minorities 1.9, and notice that upper castes are 46.4 based on these. So we are seeing a certain de degree of democratization for sure thanks largely to reservations. But notice that upper caste, we don't know exactly what the figures are, but let us say they're around 12 to 15%, uh, no, actually more like 10, 10 to 12% of the population are still highly overrepresented in our higher education institutions, even as other groups are slowly catching up with the exception of scheduled tribes and Muslims are about 12 to 13%. So notice how much they're underrepresented. Intersectionally, however, when we bring the gender question in, there's 49% women across all these groups. So that is, I find remarkable. Amongst the most underrepresented groups, women are equally present. So this is, this is the picture. This is the, 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 the partial picture. I cannot give you pictures on uh, a number on disability, uh, even though we've begun to uh, make, uh, you know, bring in uh, persons with disability through a reserve, uh, reservation policy in our public institutions. Sexuality remains invisible 
but present in many other ways in our, uh, on our campuses. Uh, I can't give you those figures, but uh, this gives you a sense of considerable, considerable diversity and heterogeneity on our campuses. And my sense is that this is not, this is unique. No other public institution has this kind of diversity based on both caste, class, gender, uh, community, and so on. Our parliament may well have considerable diversity when it comes to caste, but certainly, absolutely not when it comes to gender. Okay, so the, 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 there's a mystery here in, in, in some senses, in the sense that A, as I said, we haven't paid much attention to it, but B, it has the expansion that I spoke of has actually been much more in the sphere of private-led uh, um, higher education. It's our private, uh, some of them commercially uh, uh, led uh, for-profit uh, higher institutions have led the way. Uh, there's been some expansion in our public universities, but nothing to match this. And even as this has been the case, even as we've seen greater expansion in the private sector, which means rising fees and all of that, nonetheless, this degree of democratiz democratization seems to have happened. And this is a, a puzzle, I would, say, I would call it a puzzle that we should actually pay attention to. Next slide. Okay. I'm now jumping. I've given you this very, very brief, just with a few quick numbers, picture of, the, of higher education. And I'm now moving on to the sphere of sexual harassment and violence, an area that we do talk about a great deal, and especially post the Delhi gang rape, as it came to be called in 2012, there was a way in which violence almost stood in for the problems of women. I found that you know, when I gave talks in those years, in the years, in the months, in the years following 2012, whatever my topic was, the questions from the floor were invariably about violence. This was on everybody's mind. Something about that gang rape triggered, even though this was a very old question for the women's movement and we had been agitating, Vibhuti can speak to this, violence was, uh, was at the heart of the women's movement's uh, new face in the late 70s. Um, it did not, uh, gain that kind of traction that happened uh, uh, about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we, I, was as, uh, I was part of a task force that looked into issues. So there was also this, the moment after the, uh, not only saw amendments to the law, it also saw a kind of accountability on the part of several institutions. And one of them was the UGC. And the UGC set up a task force to look into the conditions of freedom, and uh, you know, vulnerability to, to sexual harassment on their campuses. And I was part of this team, which uh, uh, you know, went about uh, visiting some campuses, doing questionnaires with, with, with various universities. And we brought out this report called Saksham. And we were very, very shocked actually to discover the state of the situation because we assumed that 40 years and more of uh, you know, campaigning and institutionalizing of issues, legal reform would have had its impact in our institutions of higher education, but we discovered that with few exceptions, that was not the case, uh, that our university administration and many of our faculty and so on were actually not concerned with gender sensitization, that it was a subject of extreme confusion and indifference. I mean, there was a college where we were told that you know, they were, they were taking care of the problem of, 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 you know, any problems between women and men in their colleges. And how were they doing this? By having separate staircases for women and men students to make sure they didn't interact. I mean, this was their understanding of, and of course, when given a chance, CCTV cameras and so on, these were thought of as the solution. Um, what we found in talking to women, especially and men, was that there was a very deep intersectionality in terms of vulnerability. Uh, it was compounded very much by one's location, uh, women from rural locations, from lower caste, so-called lower caste minorities, uh, bisexuality, disability. In fact, I would say disability turned out to be one of the most structurally most vulnerable making. A person who cannot see, a person who is confined to a wheelchair is actually in a position of constant vulnerability in terms of their access to higher education in ways that actually had not made its impact on us prior to conducting uh, these investigations. So very much so, uh, um, uh, women from the Northeast would tell us how they were subjected to propositioning. Uh, women wearing a hijab would be uh, taunted. I mean, the modes and ways in which, you know, everyday life was made uh, uh, very difficult for women was a source of 
we were surprised. We, we imagined that things had gotten much better and that the sheer presence of women would have made the atmosphere that much friendlier. Uh, but that was actually not quite the case. Next slide. <clears throat> In terms of violence, I will say this, uh, post the gang rape, I myself had not, and prior to the gang rape, I myself had not been engaging with violence in any, in any uh, depth. I'm a researcher. I had not subjected uh, any, uh, you know, things like the National Crimes Records Bureau data. I had never looked at it very closely. I will admit this, unlike others who had, I think, done so. And I was shocked by what I found when I did look at some of this data and the figure I'm giving you here comes from the National Crimes Record Bureau. This, was, this is the 2013 figure. It has possibly changed a bit since then. Uh, when, I, when we ask everybody, you know, when we, the, the, we have data on, on crimes against women in which rape is a, is a very clear category. And when I ask people, okay, what do you think uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the basic distinction that is made in our data sets between what is called stranger rape and acquaintance rape. Um, when I ask people, okay, what do you think? What is the more common? After all, the uh, daily gang rape was a classic case of stranger rape. They, they had absolutely no, no knowledge of each other at all till that horrible incident took place. Um, when I ask people, uh, what, is your, what is your sense of how, what proportion of cases, most people think, well, they may be about equal, or you know whatever, and we couldn't be more wrong. I myself did not have a clear figure in my head. I was shocked to note that 98% of the cases that make it to the NCRB, that is to say cases that are lodged as FIRs in the police stations, 98% of these cases are known to the victim. It is a bare 2% that are the classic stranger rape, you know, somebody unknown to you overpowers you and, 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 and that's what we do. Um, so this was, this was for me uh, a very, very surprising finding. Domestic violence, the 498A is by far the leading uh, proportion of cases that come to the police and are recorded by the police. And we all know that it's not easy for a family member to walk into a police station and say that I have been beaten up or I have been abused by my family or by my husband or by my mother-in-law. And yet these are the largest figures that we have. There are other surprising findings that uh, 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 one discovered, which is to say that in cities, especially cities like Delhi, many and North Indian cities, there are several categories that actually dominate and which make you wonder what is going on in the counting of rape. One of these uh, categories is a category called kidnapping and abduction. And a kidnapping and abduction case counts as a rape when the, either when the woman is a minor, that is to say below the age of 18. And what we found from the data is that these are invariably cases where parents of the girl have lodged a case of kidnapping and abduction against the boy in a couple that is marrying or being together against the wishes of the family. So is this actually something that should be in our books under the category of rape is a question we can ask ourselves. And the larger question that I want us to think, think together with is, what is it about our socialization that makes us think that the biggest danger is from strangers and in public places, and we should never be outdoors you know, after dark. This is what we tell ourselves. This is what we tell our children uh, and so on, as though that was where the biggest danger lies. And we never say that we should be as or more concerned about people whom we trust and people who have power over us. Because if you look at the data, then in fact, that is the story. And in cities like Mumbai, where we have you know, organizations like Majlis uh, actually came out with very disturbing data where the proportion of cases of incest, that is to say rape by fathers in, in broken families was as much as, or as close to being as much as the number of stranger rapes in that city. What does that tell us? And what are, we, what are, what are the challenges here, if you like, in actually coming to terms with this kind of information? Um, and the question below, be, along with that, which I have asked many times is, what is it about, it's good that we have now applied our minds to this, that we are much better informed, that we are trying to rethink our, what we thought we knew on violence, but is there a way in which when we think about women and what ails women in our country, is there a way in which violence has come to saturate public discourses and discussions about women and gender? 
And uh, I think the, that violence must have its place, but not at the exclusion of what I will be wanting to talk about next. Can I have the next slide? Okay, so I am jumping once again to my third theme, which is on work employment. Um, and this is the area, I think very recently now it has gained traction. I'm very happy to see that there are articles in our newspapers and so on. But till recently, this was not something we discussed at all. And the data I'm giving you here is from the uh, National Sample Survey Organization. Uh, it's older data. The data has only gotten worse. Let me assure you that since that time, the data sets after this have not been made public as much as they should be. And this is the public data that we now have. And this is data that actually covers a period, 17 or more years. These were the years of high growth. These were the years when our nation went through a revolution in terms of its economic uh, structure, its landscape where we saw an expansion as never before in terms of lifestyles for some and inequalities for others. So in this high growth period, please look at this data, look at the urban figures and look at the rural figures. One of our myths, mis I mean, we are completely wrong on this. Most of us think that urban India must be offering more opportunities for work for, for you know, work for, for um, you know, for, for pay, that urban India, our cities and towns must be better for our women than our, you know, very quote unquote backward rural areas. But this is absolutely not true. More women work for pay or for some kind of income in rural India than in urban India. You can see these figures. And uh, while the figures for men are roughly, you know, remain roughly the same, they, there's a little bit of variation, but it's basically around as, you know, the same level of 50 plus, 55, 54, 55 plus. But notice that female rates are declining in both areas from a high of 32.8 in 1993, 94 down to 26 in 2009-10. And please look at the urban figures, which are first of all, practically half those of our uh, rural India, and they also decline. And these figures have been declining. So this is something that is very hard for us to get our heads around. Uh, I think um, we were rightly in the women's movement, very concerned to ensure that there was not undercounting happening. After all, we know how hard women are working. They work for no pay or what is often called unpaid work. And we were concerned to put that on the table. But I think in that process, we needed to also acknowledge that when it, come to, when it came to paid work, there was this enormous gulf. Uh, a gulf that in fact is somewhat unique to countries like ours. Other, other parts of the world do not see this kind. Everywhere there are gender gaps. Everywhere women do not get the kind of returns that men get, but nothing quite as sharp as this one and certainly not in urban contexts. Next slide. So let me pull it all together now. I don't want to take too much more time so that there's time for discussion. Let me try and pull all this together and ask all of you to think with me, what are the paradoxes and challenges then? So on the one hand, we have huge expansion in educational attainments for women, okay? Is this a sort of silent revolution? Is this not a revolution? How should we look upon this? What happens after? That was one of my questions. If indeed we have this space of our colleges and our universities and other kinds of institutes in which women are increasingly present, what are these years? What do they mean for them? In which they also ask us and in, the, in our discussions on, in, in, on issues of sexual harassment, they said they want these years to be more sexual harassment free. They want to have space to experiment. They want to have a time away from their families. They were very clear. Young women were saying we, we suffer these kinds of indignities or worse. And we want it, but for what? And in terms of what kind of future? Because these very years, of expansion have seen declines in work participation rates. Let's be, this is, this is the paradox. How can we be getting more educated and fewer proportions of women find work at the end of the day? Uh, there's an average of 15% of women who get any, who have paid work. And as I already told you, the larger proportion of these are in rural area. The larger proportion amongst our poor women, women who work out of necessity, not women who work out of desire for uh, a career and a life uh, beyond that of the home. So on the one hand, our homes are, sphere, are spheres of extreme lab labor. 
everyone across all classes and castes are exercised in the reproduction of the home. Unpaid work is subsidizing our economies. Let's be very clear that if tomorrow all the women who labored in our homes for nothing were to go on strike, our societies would collapse. They would completely collapse. They are to some extent co-subsidized by very poorly paid domestic work. Domestic work is amongst the most exploited occupation in the country. Uh, so to some extent, there is a displacement of unpaid work onto very poorly paid domestic workers. So together, let's be very clear, this is indeed the backbone of the domestic sphere that is reproducing everyday life, but it goes hand in hand with very, very small and declining proportion of women who have a life apart from this. Early marriage, there's been a lot of discussion on, you know, we want to eliminate child marriage, we want to raise the age of marriage from 18 to 21. You can talk about that as well if you like. The proportion of women who are marrying below the age of 18 has been declining quite steadily. Compulsory marriage, as you might surmise from what we are putting together here, has not declined. So overwhelmingly, that remains, in other words, the future, increasingly so. And at higher ages, we see uh, marriage rather than a good job as the future after a good education. So my question then to us, and my concluding question is, across any gender, across class, caste, disability, sexuality, what then are the choices that we are seeing? What is this paradoxical combination of attention to violence, no attention to where women are present and are actually aspiring for something more, their families are willing to put them through, maybe even pay fees for them in accessing higher education? And then what? And what is the sphere of a life after? What can we say about all this? And what does this then tell us about gender equality today? I'll close with that, the next slide. I very much look forward to your questions and thoughts. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Mary John, for a very vivid macro profile with focus on intersectional perspective, highlighting differential in achievements in education according to caste and religion. At one level, you acknowledge and all of us, the democratization due to reservation that has happened, but still massive underrepresentation. We also talk, talked about the considerable diversity and heterogeneity in the, in the field of higher education and education per se. Uh, even in for-profit educational institution, where your data uh, showed that 49% of them are enrolled because once upon a time in 91, we used to say that wherever there is privatization, women's opportunities to decline. So even NAC, had a, uh, NAC study had also shown. And uh, I think legal, legal system, you rightly say that what happens to young lovers, no? Because of a criminal justice system sees women as a, in need of protection, girl in need of protection, and boy in conflict with law. Why always the criminal justice system and what happens to young lovers and that too in current context of uh, age, uh, raising the age of marriage no, at 21. So uh, that, and I think work participation rate, extremely important thing that why doesn't our degrees translate into work participation. And last your series of questions which you asked about what choices do we have and how do we see it in terms of, uh, in the context of our dream and utopia of gender equality. Now I turn to Dr. Lina Pujari, who works with the young students. She also runs a course on gender. We have extremely popular course for our last 10 years. How would you like to uh, see this macro data provided by Professor Mary John uh, through your experience as a teacher, as a uh, uh, sociologist, and uh, also as a person who is doing a lot of uh, extracurricular and co-curricular activities with the young population. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patel. Uh, uh, am I audible? Okay. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Patel and Dr. Arun Kumar for having me here. Uh, always a pleasure to be part of uh, Infly Deliberations. And it's an absolute honor to be in the midst of Dishingri Scholars. Uh, thank you, Professor Mary John, I think for this deep penetrating insights and for kind of setting the context. Um, 
So I shall speak uh, from my position as a feminist sociologist in a South Mumbai college. Um, and my presentation today draws from my work with my students, as Dr. Patel uh, just uh, mentioned, um, in, for more than two decades or so. But it also draws from conversations uh, with fellow colleagues uh, in colleges affiliated to uh, Mumbai University. And I shall focus for the next seven to eight minutes, I shall focus on a site that I believe has a lot of potential for transformation, can enable shifts, um, ideally should be a safe space, you know, for critical reflections and conversations around gender and sexuality, and uh, engaging with questions of caste, class, ableism, um, you know, so on and so forth. And, uh, you know, uh, to be able to kind of interrogate and reimagine lip social realities, I think this should be very unique to educational campuses. But uh, as we just saw, I mean, especially, I will begin with Saksham report. Uh, that's what uh, Professor Mary John was talking about. And I, I see this as a first paradox, in fact, that I wish to present. Uh, Saksham clearly tells us that this is not the case, that you know, the way one imagines the, the, the campus space, um, surely uh, that's not what, what, what is happening in our campuses. So um, this, I think, is a first paradox that, uh, you know, when uh, uh, Mary uh, spoke about how gender was the weakest link in higher education institutions. I mean, uh, just imagine for a moment, we were busy doing everything. We were trying to be very efficient, improving quality standards, focusing on teaching, research, job, how do we connect with the job market? Everything was happening. But one thing that we completely lost sight of was, uh, was of course, uh, the whole idea or the discourse on gender equality. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> Uh, you know, and on the campus, students encounter conflicting ideologies, mixed messages that are both enabling and disabling, empowering and disempowering, and requires a complex set of negotiation. So I'm going to specifically look at the campus and talk about, um, you know, Professor Mary John's presentation actually gave you a, a wonderful context and the framework, and she looked at it, she provided the broader context. She actually looked at very, very overt and very glaring forms of inequalities and harassment and violence that we see on uh, in, in higher education. I'm going to perhaps focus on the not so visible, very, very COVID instances of sexism that we see in our campus. And probably this is something that is uh, unique to the space that I find myself in, an urban context, in a metropolis, and so on and so forth. Um, and I see an interest, and now um, another interesting paradox that I see here is from being largely absent and silenced on campus, you know, and being thought of as not worthy enough to be uh, uh, to be deliberated upon. Uh, gender equality is now interestingly everywhere. Now, gender equality has become a buzzword, you know, a popular discourse, and is now embraced by all constituencies, um, you know, from management and administration to departments and organizations. Now, there is a certain danger here in this kind of proliferation, because we really do not know how this is being interpreted and disseminated, and whether feminist insights, struggles, and discourses underpin this kind of proliferation, large-scale proliferation that we see here. So this discourse on gender equality is largely an exercise in tokenism. Now, stripped of its radical agenda, it has now become a perfunctory affair. I mean, that is what it was supposed to be, right? Rather than question and subvert the unequal power relations and masculinist uh, kind of discourses that proliferate uh, university campuses, um, uh, the discourse on gender equality today simply reproduces entrenched hierarchies. Uh, of course, there are good things also that are happening and probably I'll come to that later. Um, also, um, I wish to locate all of this in the neoliberal kind of framework that we find ourselves in. So this neoliberal and meritocratic logic that drives higher education today focuses on the individual and not so much on the oppressive social structures. So, um, uh, you know, so there is no, uh, as there is no conscious process of reflection, no questioning of privileges or talk of intersecting vulnerabilities that Mary was talking about. I mean, as to, I mean, obviously our students 
uh, do not constitute a homogeneous entity. In fact, no constituency on campus is homogeneous that way. Uh, we come from different social locations and it's very, very important to understand how these locations intersect to produce different kinds of experiences, especially for us students. And certainly that is not something which is happening. That is something that is getting lost in this kind of buzz that's happening around uh, the entire discourse on gender uh, uh, equality. Uh, so the neoliberal framework and his obsession with standardization and uniformity and, and very reductive processes actually leads to a depoliticized campus. And we are really seeing that devoid of debate and critical thinking um, aimed at not creating very conscious um, citizens, but, uh, you know, people who can very seamlessly fit into the capitalist uh, uh, market and who would not like to challenge uh, any kind of existing status quo. So, you know, there's a kind of benevolent sexism that pervades our campuses. And so, you know, you have no overt, uh, let's assume for a moment, no overt instances of sexual harassment, but all covert and implicit, implicit forms of uh, sexism continue unabated. And these are manifested, you know, commonly as loaded comments, demeaning jokes centered around women and those in gender marginal locations, stereotypical observations, unwelcome comments. I mean, cultural festivals are rife with sexual innuendos, and if you protest, you are told you lack a sense of humor, so on and so forth. You know, the subtext of everyday conversations, even among colleagues, can be quite misogynist. So the bigger challenge, therefore, is countering these benevolent forms of sexism, because these are not things which are very obvious. Uh, these are not things which will immediately attract your attention, and these can easily be pushed under the carpet and shown to be, no, no, everything is all right. Nothing to worry about, actually. So it's important, I think, to map and understand how this gender regime uh, actually operates in uh, in our campuses and this gender regime with this focus on you know savarna able-bodied cis head student uh, is constructed in very interesting ways within campuses uh, also a very interesting thing is gender equality today is largely interpreted as gender parity yeah right and so there's no problem at all uh, look at the numbers they will tell you so you know, like, so, you know, some of, uh, you know, so you will, you will have your colleagues and your staff members and students telling you that, well, do we really need this discourse on gender equality? Ma'am, just see the classrooms full of girls, right? But what we don't realize, and we did a gender audit in our, in our college, and we realized that in this, this whole thing about numbers is very interesting. Because when you move, okay, mainstream courses where the fees are less, you will see a kind of parity or probably more number of girls. But when you start moving into professional courses, you will actually see a significant reduction in terms of in numbers of not just girls, but uh, you know also um, you will see a reduction in terms of minorities, uh, in terms of uh, people from scheduled castes and scheduled tribes and other marginalized groups, um, and that's very clear. So uh, you know, so this uh, this kind of so this whole thing about oh, there's no need for conversations around gender. Apparently, capital, market, and state of the economy are serious issues to be deliberated upon. And gender is so trivial that it doesn't even merit a discussion. But how does one counter these? I mean, truncated, piecemeal, and fragmentary approaches will not help. I think a sustained dialogue, a challenge has to be mounted at different levels in multiple forums. And this is, again, where the real challenge lies. Um, you know, there are three constituencies within campuses that are particularly re uh, re resistant to the idea of change, uh, refuse to engage in a process of uh, self-reflection, and they are, in fact, I, I would say our students are far better. And these three constituencies are faculty, administration, and management. Now, um, while ICs, I mean, internal committees and gender cells, uh, have an important role to play in creating safe spaces and in sensitizing uh, uh, sort of uh, all the constituencies, I don't think uh, the burden can rest on them alone, right? It has to be an integrated and holistic uh, uh, process encompassing all aspects of teaching, research, and administration. Uh, and in fact, these, in fact, I mean, the ICs and the gender cells, that's a different story altogether, have been rendered quite powerless in many institutions, face humongous challenges in their everyday functioning. And considering, when I said there has to be a sustained dialogue um, at different levels in multiple forums, I think we also need to focus on curriculum and pedagogy, considering the androcentric nature of you know, knowledge production curricular reforms and feminist pedagogical interventions should constitute important components of the sensitization process. 
Um, <clears throat> You know, of course, uh, there are, of course, there are dangers here. This has been extensively debated by women's study scholars in the initial years when women's studies was becoming a part of was being institutionalized, you know, this whole debate of ghettoization versus mainstreaming. And, and because, as Dr. Patel said, I run a course and I have also been experiencing this. I mean, what do you want? If you want integration, the problem is if, if, these, if gender related topics are integrated into all courses and all curriculum, the other danger is the dangers of tokenism, oversimplification, I and mean, that is also there. So it's very difficult to find a way out through all this, right? And uh, pedagogues can actually play a very important role, but as, I, but as I said, the maximum resistance comes from pedagogues. So what is also, uh, so you know, it is not just curriculum, what you actually need is a necessary pedagogical shift with the necessary feminist insights, so on and so forth. The other challenge, and I'm going to conclude here, the other challenge that I see is, uh, how do we build solidarity? And how do we move away uh, from an individualized kind of activism you know, fostered by neoliberal ideologies? Uh, a process that got accentuated during the pandemic. I mean, this was something that had uh, actually started. I, at least, um, I have been witnessing this. I mean, the kind of schisms and divisions that we see in the wider society in the last half a decade, especially or so, have impacted institutions of learning as well and impeded the forging of feminist solidarity. So this is a very important question for me at the moment. So then finally to conclude, um, and I have, I hope I have stuck to my time limit, what is required, I think we need a campus that is sensitive to questions of gender and committed to an environment of equality and equanimity for multiple genders. And I think we need to really combat this culture of silence and impunity that is certainly inimical to gender justice in institutions of learning. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lina Pujari, for talking about benevolent sexism. We all used to critique benevolent patriarchy, <laughs> but now uh, this uh, other yeah, that individualized activism is not an answer because you know the classrooms have become war zones. What is your experience was my experience also in teaching uh, in, in, in uh, SNT for nearly 13 years. The way minorities, SCST, they get marginalized in the class, the ideological debates when we teach any theory uh, where the new liberalism and the might is right logic or the majoritarianism seeps in. So I think we have a long way to go, but still we all are eternal optimists, you and me both and all of us. So I think we, uh, we, we, we continue with our efforts uh, in the educational institutions. It's very important. Now I would like to ask Professor Pushpesh Kumar uh, uh, your response to Dr. Perry John and also Dr. Lina Pujari's uh, presentations. Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor Bibhuti. I'm sorry, there's some technical glitch, so I cannot no. uh, be visible. Uh, yeah, my, sorry. yeah, so fine. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm thank you to uh, I'm thankful to Impri for inviting me as discussant, and I uh, Mary's contribution is so tall that I I don't even attain certain height to see how tall it is and to reflect on her work and her, uh, you know, is, 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 is the difficult thing for me. But um, certainly I want to make, and then Lena has also opened up uh, a very broader uh, perspective, broader spectrum, you know, to sort of um, reflect on uh, the politics of gender and sexuality and many other things uh, in, in contemporary India. So what I want to say that uh, uh, that what is the cause of that Mary has touched upon three different uh, things, which apparently are uh, uh, disconnected, not not uh, connected, not fitting in. But I see there is a definite connect between all the three uh, contexts which she is talking about. And uh, I want to say that what is the cause of declining work participation of women in rural and urban areas? Uh, is this a paradox of neoliberal India interacting with uh, uh, patriarchy and reinforcing patriarchy actually, uh, right? Uh, so uh, when I say neoliberal India, there is a drastic cut. I would say that there is a drastic cut in the government jobs and uh, other investments in the social sector. I just think of uh, Mary's writing on 
increased age of marriage from 18 to 21, which was a recent attempt by the government of India. And she has written very critically. And I hope this is a very apparently a kind of entitlement, which is a very new liberal kind of entitlement, uh, yet hollowed in terms of a substantive justice. So even if you increase, as she's rightly pointing out, that even if you are increasing uh, the, the age of marriage for girls from 18 to 21. If she is a poor, even if she waits for two more years, what she is going to get out of that? So uh, there, is a, there, there is a lack of substantive justice and there are apparent things in terms of offering a number of rights to women, number of rights to LGBT community, number of rights to transgender individuals without promising a substantive justice within a neoliberal governance. So, uh, for example, uh, when, uh, when there is this question of sexual harassment within the campuses, I want to ask, what is, the, what is this move from, uh, you know, renaming it, you know, from GSCAS to ICC, Internal Complaint Committee? And what is the politics of that? The shift in nomenclature and this uh, renaming of sexual, uh, you know, removing completely the, the word sexual harassment itself. What does it indicate? What does it imply? Is this a civilizing mission and telling others that we Indian are not dirty and such things does not happen in our society or what? Despite the National Crime Record Bureau's uh, reports showing uh, uh, a definite uh, increase in private and public form of violence, and that is also underreported. So what, what all of these suggest, you know? So uh, there is a non-commitment towards translating uh, she talked about such a report into rules and laws. Uh, and we are we all are aware of this underutilization of Nirvya Fund. Nirvya Fund is underutilized. The public spaces are not being made safer for women. Uh, so uh, yeah, there is a lot of reluctance in the campuses and I'm witnessing it in University of Hyderabad to offer gender neutral spaces to LGBT uh, community, though there is some visibility of these, these persons and individuals who are seeking admission in university campuses, uh, we have got the Institute of Eminence kind of a thing, and nobody thinks of LGBTQI community. And uh, there is there is a case of one person, you know, uh, she's a trans person, and she kept writing from the first semester when she joined in in gender study course, and then uh, she came to the last semester then a room was offered to her. Then she said, now uh, it doesn't make sense to me and she declined to join. So, uh, and we have written to uh, the vice chancellor, the registrar, everyone to make all the, all the departments, uh, some space within that a gender neutral space, gender neutral, uh, you know, washrooms should be instituted uh, within them and the gender neutral hostel has to be uh, introduced in the university but, uh, you know, uh, when we, we submitted the minutes of the meeting, there's a transgender committee and I'm, I being the chair, uh, then uh, the only thing was discussed between the authorities was uh, offering a single room to this trans person. And all other things, we said that this, their problem, their harassments, and et cetera, should be brought to the inter internal complaint committee. Uh, if, uh, I mean, certain things should be introduced in the pedagogy, I mean, in the courses, different courses of science and social sciences and humanities, that was not at all discussed even by the authorities. So they just said that number two is discussed, something like that, you know, and a room was sort of offered as a temporary solution to a trans uh, person who was asking for it. So there, uh, so there is completely, so politicization, you know, becomes a bad word in the campuses these days. Uh, following, you know, this Rohit Pemula thing in our campuses. So uh, the authorities, whenever I talk to them, they say students parte nahi hai, or politics mein busy rehte hai. And politics has become a very bad word, you know. So even if women are radicalizing, women are asking for it, I mean, it is losing its relevance in contemporary neoliberal times and within neoliberal campuses where utilitarianism, uh, politics has no utility, you know what utility does have, it doesn't translate into anything. And it is not translating into anything these days, you know, uh, basically because there are a lot of censorship, a lot of other mechanism to curb it. 
so uh, so uh, and you know internal complaint committees for example in the university campuses i have seen it many places are filled with uh, those who are more conformist than supposedly radical within the campus all these in some or the other ways favor uh, i think a neoliberal agenda uh, where you offer certain rights you also have an institution called internal complaint committee you also have a transgender committee uh, like government of india has acts and rules and everything but it is not being translated into any substantive kind of rules and laws and implemented and certain resources are allocated so for example i am asking that we have a transgender committee but there is no resource even if i want to uh, uh, invite a trans intellectual or trans person to the campus and ask to give a talk to sensitize the uh, you know university community then uh, there is no budget i cannot even offer this person uh, uh, you know travel expenses uh, or offer a cup of tea or something you know so uh, so it is toothless i think uh, because uh, it doesn't have any resources so there is a committee yes uh, there are certain institutions yes which is instituted but uh, they they all are uh, and similarly you see there is a gender champion thing you know uh, which is which is created in the university campuses and which is also i see as a new, new liberal kind of an institution so when gcas was in existence there you will see that there are lots of discussion on gender equality what is gender lot of uh, people were invited to talk in the campus they were given travel expenses etc now internal complaint committee since it has come we see very few lectures and talks are being organized so what has happened so i think a kind of new liberal agenda and new liberal framework within which these things are operating so uh, so because there are not enough jobs which is being offered you know by the government and there is a there is a drastic cut in the national cake every time uh, and then uh, even if women are educated even if women are but one thing i want to say that how uh, what is the percentage of women going to technical education for example uh, not among the upper caste but uh, irrespective of the castes and how many women are into liberal arts and uh, humanities and other kinds of discipline which may not fetch much job to them so there may be uh, there may be discrepancy uh, if not within the upper caste but uh, but uh, if if you take all include all other castes so uh, so what i would say that uh, whatever the strength these institutions had whatever labor mary and others have put into you know the preparing the sachem report she has also visited the team has visited to our campus also and so much of sweat and blood has gone into making this report but it is not being translated uh uh into into any rules and laws and uh, you know strictly implemented within the campuses so i see uh, this uh, this whole civilizational mission and resourcelessness and coexistence of different institutions uh you know uh, are are coming together interacting and package the institutional aims and objectives and nomenclatures are repackaged in a way to suit the uh, very neoliberal kind of an agenda and within that we have to contextualize what is happening to gender what is happening to sexualities what is happening to uh, uh, the work participation uh, of women which is declining and there is no debate happening uh, uh, within the uh, domain of uh, government or anything there is no serious uh, engagement with the issue at all despite so feminists are there anyway they are talking uh, about it let them talk about it so uh, and then other kinds of discourses are becoming so overwhelming that gender discourse do not even take the back seat so this is what is happening in contemporary india and i think uh, mm, uh, this is where i will stop thank you everybody mam on mute thank you professor pushpesh kumar for bringing out this very important aspect of marginalization and exclusion uh, of lgbtqia community and gender uh, sexual minorities and need for the how the gender neutral spaces are also the whole facade of gender neutral spaces and tokenism of gender champions is working but uh, i am not so uh, 
demoralized the way you are. Uh, yes, the macro forces are against us, sectarian forces are against us, but there are people who are sticking out that make, and one of them is Professor Indra R. Indra. Her today's article, I think, runs out very succinctly in a, about the current nature of gender politics and what we as a feminist do uh, in the context of hijab controversy in Karnataka. Over to Professor R. Indra. Thank you. Can you hear me, people? Thank you, Vibhuti, Professor Mary John, Professor Lina, and Professor Pushpesh, and all my friends at Impri. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, well, I will just uh, react, or I should say, just share some of my thoughts on what uh, Professor Mary John and my friends here and Vibhuti have said. Just two days ago, I was having an argument with some youngsters about inequality. They, you know, were so vehemently arguing with me that there is no inequality. It's your imagination. You are a sociologist and you sociologists are always, you see, obsessed with this. And they said, okay, if the equality is already here, but if somebody is not able to use that, it is their problem. So finally I said, oh, well, you know, equality is not just of conferment of rights. It's also about <laughs> translating those rights into action. I said, anyway, you please see the world and you will know. Yes, definitely, as, you know, uh, Professor John has said, and uh, we talked about it, opportunities have increased. But it doesn't mean to say that everybody is having the same kind of opportunity. And then, so I'll just go in the same order that uh, Professor Mary John uh, uh, took. Talking about education, yes, all of us, you know, being in the institution know that number of women students has increased. In fact, uh, I was at a convocation of an institution the other day and uh, the chairperson uh, was referring to another Ayurvedic medical college, which this institution runs. And he was saying that you see, 90% of our students are women. And to me, it looks as if the time has come for giving reservation for men. But then he went on to say all the toppers were women in the recently held convocation in that institution because it's an autonomous institution. But then 30% of our students, very successful as students, have not taken up any job. They, in spite of us calling and telling them that they should, you know, uh, work, they said, no, we are, you see, happy with our lives at home. And so when Professor Mary John used the word compulsory marriage, you know, as against early marriage, immediately my thoughts went there. And talking about early marriage also quickly, I will say that all of us are very well aware of the fact that during the pandemic, early marriages increased. And one quick example is Mysore district itself, you know, where last year, that is till the pandemic uh, broke, it was about uh, 100 plus in one year, 2019-20. But in one year, 2021, the number increased to 2200. So I, uh, maybe these are just reported cases. And so I think one of the challenges, because I, ultimately these are the people who would come into higher education, so uh, I'll, I think one of the biggest challenges that are there before us, both state and civil society, is how do we handle these cases? Because my friends in the Department of Women and Child Development tell me, you know, when we go and try to stop these marriages, COVID or no COVID, uh, or, you know, we are now trying to get these girls back to school, we are attacked. So this, I suppose, is an issue that we need to give uh, you know, importance to in uh, looking at education from a different perspective. And of course, the question of where are all these women going afterwards? Everybody is talking about number increasing. So many people come and tell me, you must be very happy no, to see these classrooms today when it's only girls are there, not a single boy or only a few boys, well, who feel very uncomfortable because they are, uh, you know, outnumbered. But numbers, I'm not saying are not important. But then I think the question that most often uh, many people are failing to ask is what's happening to these women? Wherever I go ask, are you following them up? No, you know, once they leave, that's it. 
So I think this issue uh, of why we don't find these women, you know, translating this uh, qualifications that they obtain and all the distinctions, you know, which everybody is talking about. When you, I recently was at a convocation, the complete lineup was of women. But I don't think it stops at that. So it's now time to look at where these women are going and why they are not translating this into action. And also quickly talking about the private educational institutions. Yes, it's. I was at a meeting the other day where one of the members was saying that the next decade is one of private edu privatization of education. Of course, they are doing well. And as Vibhuti uh, observed in her uh, uh, remarks, uh, you know, I think it's time now to revisit that argument that uh, families are not ready to invest on women's education. But you see them there. But again, you know, as uh, uh, Dr. Mary John said, questions of intersectionality, caste, class, gen uh, religion, location, who are these women who are coming to private educational institutions? That's a question which we generally are not asking. And now, you know, the data have clearly shown, yes, there is definitely a change. And as, you know, as observed, I don't think we have to start, on, I mean, it cannot be pessimistic all the time. Yeah, there have been changes, no, no doubt about that. But then who are these women? And uh, it's definitely necessary. And now quickly going to the other two issues of violence. We've been talking about internal complaints committee. I'll just say one thing. I have been noticing, you know, in uh, recent times, there was a time when the members of the internal complaints committee in universities and colleges, many institutions do not want to have these committees, even with all these laws that have come up. But now the trend is, as I have noticed, there may be, there are exceptions, is uh, you don't want people who are going to talk, who are aware of the issue, who are going to ask questions. They keep on changing, you know, in fact, in the university, in my own university, there was a uh, chairperson of the internal complaints committee, a very formidable uh, person. And uh, she gave a press conference, you know, in which she said, not even one case out of the 22 that were recommended for punishment have been addressed. What is that, uh, you know, the action is, okay, don't uh, debar from five exams. And I don't think teachers are bothered, I'm sorry. Five examinations, uh, you know, don't really matter, but not in one action. And today the trend is we don't want activists. You know, I once walked out of a meeting in a, another university. Women's studies, they say, no, we don't want those people. You see, they are troublemakers. They ask questions and then they make life uncomfortable. So in certain, most places today, I'm subject to correction if I'm wrong, but then I, I think from what little I know, they want people who just tow the line. And so this is an issue that needs to be looked into of how the committees, you know, to which are, uh, which have the responsibility to make institutions gender sensitive are themselves gender insensitive. And the last thing is uh, talking about uh, work. And uh, well, I have nothing to say. And this question that uh, Dr. Mary John raised about how, you know, there is this negative correlation between increase of women students uh, or graduates on the one hand and uh, decrease in the female workforce participation. I think the recent uh, data also, show, I mean, more or less are in uh, tune with uh, what was the situation uh, 10 years ago. Uh, I think that it's still about in COVID times, you know, I read an article which said that it has come down to 16%, not very uh, different. So why, you know, this is uh, happening is a question. I suppose we have to keep uh, uh, raising and uh, this is something that now research has to examine. So what I uh, finally would like to say is we can't live in a euphoria that everything is fine. As I said, you know, People say, uh, if there is inequality, if there are problems, if people are not there, then it is their problem. No, I suppose it, when people can't use opportunities for e or equality, question why they can't uh, use it. And uh, here I would like to quote uh, Professor Mary John, who in a video lecture on intersectionality, she said intersectionality is about invisible women. If I, uh, if I'm right. so. 
I think it is these invisible women, you know, instead of going and making sweeping generalizations, which many people do, these invisible women, invisible women in campuses, invisible women in workforce, invisible women in discourses on violence that we have to be talking about. And uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Also, it's always invisible appear. women in decision-making bodies. Yeah. That is also <laughs> extremely important. Exactly. There used to be a place, a phase when we used to mentor women to take up higher important positions in decision-making. Now, currently, whether it is a governance or COVID management or education yeah. or politics, women are not there except for in Panchayati Raj institutions. So that is a major challenge. There are two questions to Dr. Mary John. Uh, one is uh, from uh, Rajpreet Kaur. Can you tell me more about the reasons for uh, Sikh women in more in education and uh, men are more into business and farming. Uh, so they are more prone to drugs. What is the scenario when it comes to education abroad? Mostly Sikh men go abroad for education. Do the privileges of caste, urban areas, maybe even economic privilege, uh, seemingly pre present a paradox in case of abuse and domestic violence? The privileges that should enable the emancipation of women seemingly pull them back into the cycle of abuse and violence. Is it because they do not have privilege of strong, neat community based on solidarity, their lack of fight for the privileges they already have or comfort in privileges? How to explain this? Uh, thank you for the, the very uh, different questions. Let me take one at a time. Yeah. Um, yes, the first one <clears throat> regarding the much, much higher uh, gross enrollment ratios uh, uh, among Sikh women compared to men. And it becomes, let me add the paradoxical effort of that, as you know, is that these adverse child sex ratio and the adverse sex ratio is the highest among six. So much, much more sex determination testing, much, much more elimination of female fetuses amongst the six. Much fewer girls are being born. And yet amongst those who are born, they do much better in terms of education. So that is the, actually the double, double structure here. Uh, and I think you've, you've answered it actually quite well. Um, and it has to do with by the way, there are these discrepancies in other groups too, but it often gets, gets covered over that women are, and it, I think it should be, un, there should be like, we have to sort of nuance it in more than one way, but yes, it would appear that among, in the Sikh community, the proportion of men who want to enter professional levels of education as distinct from forms of self-employment uh, uh, rural work, and mind you, the, the proportion of, you know, the Jat Sikh farmer, which is a kind of a stereotype, the proportion of, 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 of Jat Sikh farmers is actually coming down. Many, in fact, these young men, and that's part of the question of drugs that you've raised, there is a huge crisis in states like Punjab in terms of young people and young men's future. They wish to have a, if they've seen prosperity of a certain kind, thanks to the Green Revolution, and they wish to move away. From, from agriculture as a consequence, and where do they go? So uh, there is therefore a crisis of masculinity that is lurking in these figures, I would, I would say so. And another crisis of, for women who wish to, who are clearly, this, this clearly points to the fact that they want, they aspire for something in terms of this, uh, you know, being able to access higher education without their brothers being necessarily in the picture, um, but for what? And, uh, and where and in what kinds of higher education that there was a very important question raised by other speakers. Uh, will we see Sikh women outside of a college, uh, a BA, BCom, BSc college? Will we see her in, a, in, a, in, a, you know, in an engineering institution, in a law institution, in, in medical uh, uh, training? Uh, uh, where are we likely to find her? And what then of her future uh, beyond that? Uh, so yes, I think there is this huge, huge discrepancy here that actually does deserve much, much more attention. And which I also found in field work when I was doing field work in the Punjab uh, around the issue of sex ratios, it was very clear there too that, and, and so we are seeing dropouts very often 
even amongst boys. We often talk about the dropout rate and we refer only to, to women and girls, but there are dropout rates. There is a, a, you know, an anomie, a lack of connection that actually demands our attention where boys are concerned as well. Uh, your suggestion that the, uh, you know, that because there's so much out migration, uh, that would have, that's an empirical question that would be looked at. I don't know whether the proportions of, you know, people migrating to Australia, uh, um, Canada, and so on, the US, uh, the UK, whether that would be statistically so significant that to say the girls are being educated at home and the boys are being sent abroad for their education, would it be as statistically significant to account for this discrepancy? I don't have an answer for you. I, I would encourage you to look at this though. I think that's a, that, that, that this really does call for a, a very careful, a genuine gender analysis of what is happening among Sikhs today. Um, the other question which was um, around Violence, can I just, I think I should like to see that once more because, um, look at it. Oh, okay. I think it's been about the violence also, no backlash. What was the violence. second question again? It was a backlash of violence, no? That at one level, they are getting educated, but what they are facing in the personal life is about domestic violence, abuse. Oh, right, the privileged women. Uh, well, I think we we'll go slow here. And you're, you're jumping, I think you're trying, you are trying to do what I want us to do, which is to bring the question, bring the different levels and, you know, questions together. Um, our, our, uh, the violence data that is at not, not so much from the NCRB, but if you look at the domestic violence data from other sources like the National Family Health Survey and so on, which I think is very problematic because when you walk into someone's house and you're asking them about immunization of their children and the next question you ask is whether your, your husband is beating you and so on and so forth, I really would like to know who, who's going to answer that question and how. Uh, because that kind of data would tend to show that it is poorer and so-called lower castes that have more domestic violence uh, than the so-called upper castes and the urban middle classes. Uh, so, so I think this is a complex question, but where there is definitely an issue uh, in terms of domestic violence and also a point I never did not raise here, which is suicide rates. It's something we are not looking at. We have the worst suicide rates amongst newly married housewives, so-called housewives. The numbers far exceed the farmer suicides and farmer suicides have got their share of attention, not enough by any means. But when we talked about farmer suicides, we recognize that there's an agricultural crisis of some sort. But these figures of housewives, which are proportionately more and are not only more, but they're going up, are largely in the South Indian states, states where we have quote unquote better indicators in terms of education and so on. What is going on here? Is this a backlash violence? Is this a backlash where women, and by the way, this kind of uh, figure is unique in the world. Elsewhere, when young people are lonely and uh, you know, suffering from lack of you know, uh, uh, comradeship and have suicidal thoughts, one of the solutions that is proposed is that they find significant relationships in their world and suicide rates go down when you form a union with a person that you care for and that, uh, you know, that they care for you. Here we have the opposite picture. We have young women who enter the portals of marriage and the suicide rates and the domestic violence rates jump. Uh, what is going on here? I am ashamed to say that even as the women's movement began in the 70s with looking at issues of domestic violence, and sometimes it was, they were called dowry deaths or dowry murders, always not true. Some yes were because of harassment over dowry, but others were not necessarily, but they got that kind of a tag. I think we have lost that. That has been gone missing very badly today. And uh, there is therefore something that is very, very perturbing amongst those who may be looking for something other than um, uh, what they find. And in several studies, it is found that in fact, it is the so-called docile woman who is not asking too many questions where indeed things seemingly are okay, but women, uh, Women who are working and husbands are unemployed is one of the most conflictive kind of situations you can imagine uh, and, and, and so on. So, so we lack, and this is, I speak, say this as a researcher, we lack good research. Many of you are sociologists and so on. These are areas that can't be done with numbers. These are areas that can't be done with a survey. 
these are areas that are crying out because clearly women are in their respective homes where horrible things are happening uh, and somehow it is not newsworthy enough for us to look into it. So, so thank you for that. Who are running helplines, they had to say the same thing. Even work, women working from home, even professionally competent women, they face tremendous domestic violence yes. over the last two years. Yes. Yeah. So now there are no more questions. So I just uh, round for you about way ahead, what can we do in this uh, difficult times? So over to Professor John, what would you like to say? Oh. Now, <laughs> what is the way, ahead? Of you the, the way ahead, well, I'm a researcher, the way ahead is to make all this much more visible and much more unacceptable. We must not, it's simply not, it cannot be acceptable any longer. I feel we are fail, failing a new generation of young women. Uh, I mean, people like Lena and so on, who are dedicated to a new generation of young people. I sometimes feel we are really failing them in so far as some of this that is the future that awaits them or even the present that they're negotiating. Uh, what they and, and I think uh, uh, Pushpesh also raised this question, where are they? The large proportion of both men and women, 85% of these great figures of expansion in higher education are doing a BA, a BCom or a BSc. That is 85%. Now, nothing wrong with a nice, uh, you know, all round education, but what is this? Is this, you know, a friend of mine once called this an adult crash, a place, a <laughs> park, you know, these people, otherwise God knows what they would be up to. And the poor Lenas are managing these adult crashes in the most amazing ways and Professor Indra and, and Pushpesh, but what, but what, you know, uh, what would it take to make some of this more unacceptable? What would it take to call out? And I'm very, grateful that uh, Pushpesh mentioned the issue of raising the age at marriage, which has, by the way, 90% of people think this is a marvelous idea. I've had to argue with very, very good public figures, famous public figures, I won't name names here, media, media celebrities, all of whom think this is a marvelous idea. And this is definitely a step forward towards gender equality, let the men and the women, by the way, if in fact, tomorrow, men and women of 21 were marrying, that would be a very interesting moment. Indeed, because we all do want to see that inequality reproduced in the marriage age. Uh, that's not going to happen. Even when you raise the age to 21, you're going to simply see more women child enter zones of illegality. Uh, that's going to be the In fact, story. the percentage of child marriages have gone up after the declaration of age at 21. Yeah, well, it's maybe it's they will be hurrying the now. Political to marry reasons, their... but yeah, they have... Yes, yes. The same thing happened with the Sharda Act in 1929 right, right. when they wanted to raise it to 14 there was a big rush to quickly get married. Uh, uh, so who knows, there will be, yes, uh, massive amounts of marriages happening now uh, to try and for, you know, get out of that particular uh, uh, impending, possibly impending. Uh, so we are seeing promises being made by the state today that are false. Let me call them simply false. And we are seeing gestures for fixing and naming which are costless. There is no way around genuine expansion. There is no way around what all of you have been talking about and engagement even in higher education with real issues. When Pushpesh said, you know, you have, uh, you know, now transgender is not third gender and the government is looking very progressive and radical, but there's nothing behind it. There, is, there are no teeth to those. So what would it mean to actually demand that in fact, it should be possible to bring someone to speak uh, on the issue and actually, you know, uh, change our public perceptions on these things. So what can we do in the field of research? Uh, what can we do as teachers? What can we do as activists? Uh, how can we make things in our public domain not okay? And um, that is, I think, our job. We have to disturb that as best we can uh, in, in, in where we do. And I think the speakers who came after me showed what it is they could do if they had a little more support than they currently have. And I think replicate the efforts like Saksham because currently whatever you may say, Pushpesh, but that is the only go-to reference material you have, wherever, whether uh, new uh, universities, more than 200 new universities have come up after national education policy. They have nothing there. That's the only thing which we can download. It is in public domain. It doesn't yes. ask for 120 euros and $80 <laughs> for the document. 
So I think, and plus it's a collective wisdom has gone into fem, of the feminists who have dedicated their life for 30, 40 years, Uma Chakravarti, Mary John, and so all, the, all the members who had done so much of work. It's a commitment, uh, right perspective. And also the appendix, I find the most fascinating in Saksham report are appendix, because you have given how to organize the workshops and what should be the course curriculum. And I always suggest that uh, to any new university which asks for orientation, I said first thoroughly read Saksham report and especially till the appendix, don't give up. Uh, uh, that is very carefully you read appendix and you will get the uh, this thing, no perspective and how to go about it. No? what kind of uh, structures and courses that you need to uh, put in place for gender sensitization. So now Lena, please go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I think way forward, um, uh, actually, uh, I, I will say way forward is suction. I mean, as you rightly said, it's one of the, uh, my starting point is always suction. Yeah. And in fact, um, the course that I run the inspiration was suction because one of the recommendations was to have these kind of short-term courses um and you know so the reason we started this course was because we realized that this kind of tokenism you know one of program two three programs is mandatory so i have to write a report so i have to do it you know students a top-down approach students not taking ownership so we actually wanted to do away with that right and which is why this this course has uh, kind of actually destabilized those kind of uh, very hegemonic discourses. Yes. It's interesting. I mean, so the way forward would be when students come to you and tell you, show you the book and say, look at the uh, homophobic content, look at the transphobia here, look at the sexism here, see how it's written, you know, whether it's FC courses, whether it is sociology, whether it is psychology. I think that is when things start moving. When at that level, it starts happening, um, that, that's actually the way forward. When students begin to take ownership. And, and that's, that is something that we really need to work towards. The other thing, I think, there are kind of looking, looking at this axis of marginalization. So we have looked at caste and class and uh, multiple genders. We have looked at ageism, ableism. I think one thing that we need to center more, or probably we haven't done enough and correct me if I'm wrong, is this whole issue of mental health concerns, which is actually coming up in a big, big way among the younger lot. So how to create spaces, you know, uh, uh, spaces which are not disabling, spaces where they feel good. Now, how do we transform this and make the world a better place to live in is something that we all really need to engage with. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lina. Uh, I think Saksham, one thing I would like to add, I uh, recommend it even to the medical colleges, engineering colleges, and I said, you can trick your course, and, but main thing is perspective. Even the trade unions, the new young shop floor level trade unions, they are not members of the centralized union, but there and also the women's groups and all. So I think it's a, because that is the document where everything is there in one document. No? So I think it's a very good suggestion. As a, uh, now, Professor Puspesh Kumar, would you like to contribute about the way forward. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the way forward, I'm little, uh, really very confused in the current scenario. And I think classrooms are a space, a uh, pedagogical space, where definitely you can sensitize, you can provoke debates, etc. But that space is also being eroded uh, in the contemporary context. You know, one of uh, one of the colleagues would tell you that if you say something against the state, against the government, against something, somebody might record it today, right? Uh, so, you know, a different scenario has crept in in, in contemporary times, and one gets very very confused. And so one has to also be. I I have turned very very strategic in the classroom. So I should say something, but not hit directly. You know, how to devise uh, this kind of a strategy of teaching, communicating within the class, uh, and, uh, you know, still, uh, you know, uh, sensitize people, still uh, debunk uh, in the class. Debunking is a job of sociologists. Uh, unpack and debunk in the class, but also be a strategic. This is, this is the way. And then I think it is the job of the student community, those who feel for it, those who feel for social transformation, those who are from certain social background and all, to intensify 
their struggle to intensify their stay. But there are a lot of other things coming up. There are a lot of censorship. There's a lot of, uh, you know, authoritarianism, which university institutes in different ways. Like if you participate in a, in a, a student uh, kind of stir or movement or something, then you will be not allowed this or that. So these kind of measures are coming and I'm seeing that the student activism is declining within the campuses these days. And then uh, you have uh, all these new private universities, which are uh, also new liberal spaces and uh, also, you know, orchestrate as meritocratic spaces, you know. So there's no caste, there's no class. They, they all are looked at by the corporate as meritocratic spaces. So all these things are happening and create, uh, making me a little confused to uh, say something very, very com com concrete. But still, I'm also optimistic. I'm hopeful that through critical pedagogical practices and a strategic way of, uh, of provoking uh, the young, young people and all might help in certain ways. And it may have certain intended, unintended consequences. Yes, Professor Pushpa Kumar, uh, there are some new optimistic spaces like the civil society organizations, community-based workers, then uh, community-based organizations, trade unions, self-help groups, uh, urban local self-government bodies or neighborhood groups, even regional language media is opening up because there is a complete vacuum so far as the gender issues are concerned. And because of the periodic directives sent by UN and international bodies, there is some curiosity. So I think those spaces, if we reach out, I think uh, the, the, that, and I think all of us have been doing also in some way or the other. So I think that the, so university spaces are becoming more centralized and authoritarian, but at the same time, all of us who were involved uh, in the pandemic, uh, no, responding, responding to the pandemic, I think we also created new comrades and new solidarities no i think that is i think experience of all of us professor indira what would you like to say because you write extensively in canada and also i think if you write one article in english you write three in canada so what is your experience of well all i need want to say is that uh, i think this has already been said that uh, whether it's gender or sociology or economics or whatever the discipline may be all these critical issues must be brought you know, into the public domain in a language which people understand. And I think that uh, for all of us, there is this choice, you know, we know that there is always this, uh, the path of compromise is very easy, but the path of conflict is difficult. Then, But then we have to choose that when we have to speak. I totally agree that academic spaces are becoming extremely restricted and people are watching, but then let them watch, you know, if there is nobody who will come and ask questions, say something that, uh, you know, like if they don't dissent, uh, well, then I think things are going to get worse. And I must also say that uh, gender, you know, we're talking about gender. It's not something that is to be taught only in the classroom, right from the school stage. And I'm also happy to share with you that in Karnataka, you know, which is trying to go in a big way to introduce NEP, they are trying to bring gender right from the school level. And uh, I was uh, kind of part of that committee which was looking into gender issues. And it did have very sensitive people, both uh, from the civil society and uh, the teaching community. So in, right from the concepts, you know, everything has been included. I only hope it becomes operational. And uh, now is an opportunity. I think we tried doing that here to bring gender into all disciplines, as you said, not just as one subject. But let me also tell you that uh, though NEP you know, said there is uh, flexibility, etc., there are many universities which say, okay, women's studies, let it be minor. What is you know, so major about it? So I also feel the last thing I would like to say is it now things have come to individuals. If you are talking, if you're writing, if you're speaking, if you're, you're giving visibility to what you believe in, I'm sure that there is hope still. And it is the younger generation, you know, that really needs to be addressed. And that must be done with all seriousness. And uh, there are institutions, as you have very rightly said, doing it, but it has to go. And I hope that in the next couple of years, 
you know, with the gender coming into the uh, curriculum and action and certain courses which are skill based, which are like you call, you know, they are known by different names, uh, coming into education at all levels. I'm sure that change will come. And but we have to do it with all seriousness. That's all. Thank you. With this optimistic note, we'd like to conclude. Would you like to say anything, Professor Mary John, or should I go ahead with my concluding remarks? Okay. So I think we had a very, very uh, enriching discussion and today's deliberations were very, really profound and meaningful and brought to forth the dualism with regard to gender concerns. Constitutional guarantees of gender equality in terms of policy and politics need serious examination. All of us agreed. Suffrage for both Indian men and women was granted some 70 years ago, uh, 75 years ago, but uh, creating a culture of political involvement and widespread uh, uh, genuine uh, concern, uh, making the democracy, deepening of democracy, that is still a challenge. But the political culture is rife with misogyny, casteism, colorism, uh, communalism, and social inequalities. They are very difficult to approve, but still we are striving. Uh, uh, along with voting rights, we have political involvement of women was also very, very important at the time of freedom struggle. And currently we see uh, uh, that kind of involvement only in the Panchayati Raj institutions. Uh, and I always, whenever I go there for gender budget uh, session uh, with the women elected representatives, whether they are of urban self-government bodies or the rural self-government body, it serves as a tonic. I come up with so much of optimism that whatever they are doing at a micro level is very, very, uh, and, and that the collective, the spirit of collective uh, and is, uh, is found. We had Equal Remuneration Act 1970 six which guaranteed equal opportunity treat, equal treatment and equal rewards for work but still as professor mary john told us the deplorably work participation need, uh, uh, rate at the same time it 80 92 percent of women in informal sector where the law of jungle prevents dr professor pushpesh kumar in invited her attention of marginalization and ex exclusion of the um, uh, sexual minorities even the transgender persons rights act 2019 is full of limitations and full of total insensitivity it has shown when the developmental needs of the transgender community are, uh, 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 are uh, concerned and uh, goddess worshiping Indians also have no qualms in pre-birth elimination of girls and female uh, and also the female infanticide Mary John gave us uh, Dr. Mary John gave us startling data on uh, sex, uh, child sex ratios and this paradoxical situation of women in India is alarming we all the uh, 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 the incidences of gender based violence is not only limited to just dowry death and sexual harassment but wide range of uh, both online and offline uh, violence abuse uh, are happening uh, pandemic has uh, has also brought out the ugliest aspect of forced uh, labor of modern forms of slavery and also the forced child labor forced, uh, and early marriages uh, that we have seen. Uh, discriminatory practices uh, have also compounded and the globalization uh, of Indian economy, neoliberal uh, ethos that have percolated in each and every walk of life have also made the life for uh, much more complex and paradox of gender equality uh, and the employment market are most pronounced and uh, we uh, Indian feminists have major challenge and we have used opportunity to enact more social change in India through street fighting, through demand for a, um, progressive labor uh, progressive laws and also uh, you know, uh, women's studies as a movement has also raised some of the very, very uncomfortable questions uh, uh, to the onslaught that we are facing. So we have, ch we have ask questions about gender norms and biases, uh, discriminatory practices in the family law, family laws, religion-based family laws, and 30,000 customary laws which are governing marriage, divorce, custody, guardianship, rights, property, inheritance, and right to stay in a matrimonial or parental home. So our feminist activism needs to continue in these difficult times of sectarian backlash that uh, threatens gender equality. And I'm so proud and I'm so uh, humble to have these four experts as a panelist and Professor Mary John who has set the tone and three discussants who all have 
both courage of conviction and intellectual clarity to meet the challenges of this sectarian times. Thank you very much. Over to Impreeti. Nika. As we have come to the end of this extremely enlightening session, I, Karnika, researcher at Impre Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the Impre Gender Impact Studies Center. We are grateful to Professor Vibhuti Patel for chairing the session and to Professor Mary E. John for taking out the time for being with us and sharing such a thought-provoking talk on paradoxes and challenges in approaching gender equality in India today. We thank our discussants, Professor Pushpesh Kumar, Professor Indra Ramara, and Dr. Leena Pujari. Thank you for adding your diverse perspectives and valuable insights to the deliberation. And of course, we thank all our participants here on Zoom or on Facebook Live for participating and raising pertinent questions. We are grateful if you're watching us later on YouTube or listening to us on our podcast. I hope that you continue to tune in our future to our gender gap series and in free hashtag web policy talks. Thank you once again, and I wish you all a very good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.